Here it's, we are. We've whoa. arrived at Fort Apache. That, this is, it looks like a carnival horror show. You know, like. 100%. There are toilets all over the place. When we pull up to Dale Varnum's compound, the first thing we notice are toilets. Dozens of freestanding toilets, and they're scattered across the ground in front of the compound's high wooden walls. The walls, which look to be rough-hewn timber, give the place the feel of an old western fort, but the toilets and the massive collection of other strange objects out front make it feel like it's maybe the beginning of a Blumhouse movie. What we're seeing here is a bunch of toilets on wooden stumps yeah. with uh, signs, signs hand-painted, handwritten yeah. signs yeah. with what, what, what seem to be jokes, rhyming jokes, that don't make any sense. No, but they all conclude the word commode. Here's, here's one. Stupid people drop their crap on other people. Why not drop it in a commode? I'm very confused. Mm -hmm. Dale is the one who dropped his crap on other people. He ratted out the whole town, right? Right. It seems hypocritical to have a toilet in front of your house that says, don't drop your crap on other people when you're the one who did exactly that. Maybe. It's a message to himself. Oh, you mean like a, like a post-it note? <laughs> <laughs> in the form of a toilet? In the form, because I lose post-it notes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and a toilet? You would not lose a toilet. No, you would not. It's a very significant reminder. Well, thankfully, one thing we don't see right away is the attack turkey. That's true. But the toilets were only the tip of the iceberg. God, yeah, there is so much stuff cluttering up the front of this property. It's like you don't want to walk in there. And there's a giant bus that says the Crackhead Express serving Brunswick County. Yeah. There are signs all over the place that says Fort Apache... Pills kill and destroy families. Here's another sign. All leprechauns are welcome. Over here on the right, a municipal bus with a giant nose on the front and ears popping out the side and a very large shark jettisoning off the roof. And the inside of the bus is filled with mannequins and is being driven by a giant deranged skull is what I would perhaps... Pretty well captured. Got that. <laughs> Before we even get a chance to knock on the door, Dale Varnum walks out from the compound. Finally, after all this time, we're going to meet the man at the center of all that happened here. Did Dale Varnum really do a deal with Pablo Escobar? Or is he simply a small-time drug dealer with a big-time imagination? Welcome back to Varnum Town. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go and say hello. Oh. Josh. Josh. You Josh. Dale, I'm okay, Josh. Josh, I'm glad to know you, Josh. Nice to meet okay. you. Yeah. So I guess you owe my brothers now because this is definitely my brother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like your sweatshirt there. The Psycho Ward? But you're an outpatient, so it's okay. Yeah, I'm an outpatient. Now. Good, very yes. good. He's wearing a sweatshirt that says he's an outpatient of the Alcatraz Psychiatric Ward. So there's a lot to unpack about these first moments with Dale. First of all, he doesn't look intimidating. He's about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, if you include the spiky gray hairpiece that he's wearing. And, by the way, the first thing he says to us is he, that we're his brothers? Yeah. I mean, he doesn't know us. No. I'm not quite sure what that reference is What about. is he talking about? Yeah, yeah. After we explained that we're there to talk about the history of Arnhem Town, he invites us inside, but not through the front door. Okay, we're going to take us through the side another way. Kyle, you ready? I'm ready. Dale leads us through an entrance in the fence into a very strange, winding, plastic tunnel with a rotting wooden floor. It's uh, quite a long tunnel, actually. Almost too this much. This tunnel, There's... you see how far this goes? This tunnel is probably 50 yards as far as I can see. That's, that's uh, a long tunnel. Amazing. And yeah. Are you brave enough to walk through there? Well, 
<laughs> you first. <laughs> By the way, let's not get separated. We're surrounded by all manner of mannequins. So there's a, a departure and arrival, like board, airport board, board that's board. talking about like arrivals from Los Angeles, La Paz, New York, Sioux City, and large candy canes and a bottle of Sky Vodka. Yep. Dale leads our audio team away from us, leaving Josh and I further and further behind in the tunnel. And it's very dark in here. Yeah, and the tunnel goes on for And there's good. cats walking all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Oh, my God. Eventually, Dale comes back. Why do you, what, what, why do you have all this stuff? It's just something with me. I've always been crazy. I help people. Do you, you understand right. what I'm saying? Actually, no. We had no idea what he was telling us. What is, what is happening here with these commodes? Will you explain this to me? Well, it's just something I'm half crazy with, of course. Are you trying to sell toilets? Is no, this a no, sale? people need me toilets. You ain't seen nothing when you go into town. When you say go into town, you mean when we go inside the, uh, yeah, the you, fort? Yeah. yeah, you fix and go in for the pack. Yeah, okay. When Dale says go into town, he doesn't point in the direction of Varnum Town. He points deeper inside his own compound, beyond the tunnel. It reminds me, actually, a little bit of a David Lynch film. Did you see her over there covered with roaches? Look. Yeah, this mannequin is covered with, ro uh, with roaches. It yeah, that's about as close of a representation as you can get right there. There's a patch that it looks like you've sewed on, and then it says in the middle, mm -hmm. I solemnly swear that I am up to no, no good. good. That's what everybody thinks. <laughs> Well, they think that because you've got a patch on your shirt that says yeah. that. As we follow Dale into his lair, we just want to ask him questions about Pablo Escobar, but he keeps veering away from us through the twists and turns in this strange plastic tunnel we're in. And the whole time, we have the distinct impression that we're being watched. And there's a reason. Glued onto nearly every surface are googly eyes. Everything has eyes here. There's googly eyes on the skulls, on wood. Uh-huh, it's great. Do you feel like you're being watched, maybe? Is that what you mean? Yeah, or? yeah. and everybody else thinks they watch when they come in here, too. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I see these googly eyes all over the place. Yeah. If you put them everywhere, what, uh, what do they mean to you? Why are there googly eyes? And for some reason, I do put eyes on everything. You do put yeah. eyes everywhere. Had you ever given any thought to that, Dale? Or huh? Any, deep, any deeper thought to that, why you do that? Is it just, I'm just curious as to why the eyes... Are these your friends? Is it, is it a way of feeling... Yeah, like you have, like, company? Yeah. Look is, so you're not lonely, you've got... Do the eyes different... scare you, or do they comfort you? No, they comfort me. Okay, so it must be feeling like you're, this is a... F they're, they're friends. They're, oh, they're like Christmas. people who are around you. Are they all the people you betrayed? Hmm. All right, come on, we've got to move fast. Got when I mentioned the people he had betrayed, Dale walked quickly away. And that's when we encountered the turkey. An aggressive attack turkey followed by a posse of thuggish chickens. There's a turkey. Chicken is fo The chicken and the turkey yeah. are following us. Dale's attack turkey is now tracking us. Are the uh, turkeys aggressive? So we pick up our pace to put some distance between us and the turkey. Okay, let's go back this way. We'll go around. Okay, come on. We've got to move fast. We emerge from the plastic tunnel into an acres-wide field packed with stuff. So there is a mannequin here with a baby doll head. Here's a propane tank with a devil mask on it. And there's skeletons there. That looks like a baby skeleton. Oh, that was some of my family. Don't worry about that. Yeah, because there's a pink ambulance, a yellow ambulance, yeah. uh, two white ambulances. Yeah. We're now outside of the Hall of Mirrors and have emerged into a kind of sandy field that is filled with vehicles, many, many vehicles. For instance, you have this Ford Focus here with all the windows blown out and a golf cart sitting on top of it. So, like, what's the meaning of that? But it's been placed on top. It's, it's not It's embellishment. He's taken a sports car and glued shells all over it. Remember, there's the... Uh, there's, your, there's your Shelby Mustang covered in shells. Ah, that's why it's called, it's a Shelby. I'm not even sure it's a Shelby, yeah. but it is now because it has shells on it. it. It feels like the fever dream of a narco-trafficker. Speed boats, fast cars, oil drums, and it's all tossed into the sky and left to land helter-skelter in the sand dunes. Yeah. 
So when did you start collecting toilets? I started collecting toilets probably back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. you can ask anybody around here about right. it. They'll, they'll tell you, I love commodes. But when I grew up, we didn't have commodes. You had... Uh, I mean, when the first commode come in... You had an outhouse, I, I'm yeah. assuming, yeah. Do you remember being excited about the commode? Yeah, I did. It's the way people looked at you. You know what I mean? Because if you had a commode, it was a sign that you were doing well. Yeah, great day in the morning. A commode means something. Mm -hmm. But to collect that many is a little extreme. Fort Apache, we learn, was inherited from his dad, Olaf Varnum. Before Dale turned it into the madhouse it is now, it was actually just a gas station. That's how Dale and Olaf got into the smuggling business. Olaf would fuel smuggling boats and planes. In fact, 19-year-old Dale's first smuggling job came from a phone call in the middle of the night. Smugglers, hoping to reach his dad, asked Dale if he could bring a tow truck and help them pull an 18-wheeler that had been full of weed out of the mud. And in return, the next day, his dad handed him an envelope of cash for his cooperation and his silence. And that's one thing that got me started into dancing with the devil, I called it. So you you are an unusual person. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering where you got it from. I got was it. Was your dad got, unusual? Was yeah, your mother my unusual? my dad, and not only that, when you come up, like I come up here, in a place like this right here. Well, but we've people. met the other people here, and they're not like you. No, I guarantee you ain't all of them. You know, that's why they think I'm crazy. I mean, was it something that was your dad's influence? Or was your dad crazy? Well, was daddy, your mom My daddy was crazy? good. My daddy, right. if he seen you what now, either one of you what now, his hands were always greasy. They tell you everything, and he ain't doing, you know what I'm trying to do? He's on the show part of He'd his slap life. slap you on the back yeah, with his greasy and, hands. And people still talk about it all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Why it, do you think he did that? What was the what was the rationale for that? It was just good. He was good to people. He was good to people by slapping them on the back with greasy yeah, hands. That doesn't. That sounds like no. he just ruined your shirt. Yes. The smuggling was all pretty small time until Dale decided to level it up in the early 1980s. And then, when it did, it just changed me. Here, here it was. You could walk up somebody that you know, that you really know, you can walk up to him and say, you want to make 20000 Help me a couple hours offload this boat. And it started building, building, and building. And, oh, my God, it just started coming in every kind of way. It weren't the greed of money as much as it was the adventure. Some of the happiest times of my life, I'd be laying on a boat 80 to 120 miles off here to the Gulf Stream, just laying there waiting. I'd be waiting on a plane to come over. And if a plane's going to be there, say, at 11 o'clock at night, about a quarter to 11, we'd go run out lights. And sure enough, you, here they'd come. You would not even see who dumped it. And it just got so easy, and it just started growing, growing, growing. I put me a high-altitude radar unit in my bedroom. I could sit there in my house at night and watch a plane. If I had a plane coming in at 11, 11 o'clock, like I said, or 12, 1, whatever time, I could sit there and watch it coming in. You know what? I love this image of Dale lying there in bed with a massive spinning radar unit on his roof, and he's just laying there. At, at his at his at fort. His, at his fort. Watching all his cocaine planes circling the runway. <laughs> and he's got a air traffic control readout at the foot of his bed. <laughs> while the entire police force and the clam cops and half a town are running around out there trying to bring it in for a landing. Dale is just kicking back in bed. Just watching his radar. <laughs> and he's just surrounded he's by just, piles of cocaine yeah. and money. And do you think the Playboy playmates are there and, and sure. they're trying to trying to get his attention? He's yeah. like and he's just looking at that line rotating around yeah. that gr yeah. that green screen. Well, yeah, there, there goes another one. Yeah. They would come from Florida, the Playboy bunnies would come from Florida. And I had a bunch of them that stay at the house, and when they did, they come, and I would uh, let them mow my grass. 
So they go out there and mow the grass, and there's three of them. And they got their white little things on and their little bunny tail. And everybody come by. It looked like a car lot in front of my house, sitting in a pool off side of the road on both sides. People just sitting there looking. What in the world is that? Who is that? You know? And it was just crazy stuff that I used to do. But you'll get a kick out of it. I, my Christmas tree, you know, some, I had a big Christmas tree in my house for Christmas. Everybody come there. I, I had put two kilos of cocaine on the Christmas tree, put it in little bags. You know, you had all, separated it out. You yeah, had separated yeah, the two kilos yeah, into little and bags. I put little, uh, like a gram in each bag, and mm -hmm. the, the Christmas tree was decorated with lights and nothing. That, and everybody come in, they'd laugh. <laughs> they didn't think it was real. Were they supposed to take take a little ornament? They, was that they thought it was, they thought it was just fake. You know, most people. Okay. That must have been a really white Christmas. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about uh, your father got you into the smuggling business originally but then in the early 80s mm -hmm. that's uh, when i switched from pot to coke well that's mm -hmm. what i wanted to get at you you kind of expanded and grew the business mm -hmm. and and part of that was going to meet pablo escobar when i met pablo it was on that one trip when i really got to meet him there so i guess it i i guess this is real okay yeah, he just verified that. To the I, extent that you can believe him, but... Uh, I, I had a question about that. I mean, it seems like a pretty big jump, you know, from Dale Varnum to Pablo Escobar. First time I ever met Pablo Escobar, I remember seeing him, and that was in Nicaragua. I had flew through the Shiny Pass and landed there. Translating here, Dale is claiming he met Pablo Escobar at a place called the Shiny Pass in Nicaragua. We looked it up. There's no record of it. But on the other hand, there is some aspect of this that is plausible, which is that in 1979, there was a huge shootout at the Dadeland Mall in Miami between rival cocaine dealers. Mm. And that focused the United States' attention on the cocaine trafficking problem. And specifically, it focused everybody's attention on South Florida. Yeah. So starting at the beginning of the 80s, there was too much heat in Florida, yeah. and the cartels went looking for new inroads. Yeah, it's a good argument as to why they were searching for places like Varnum Town. Yeah, why they might have been open to meeting somebody like Dale Varnum. Yeah, yeah. Varnum Town was laid back, and by, by having the places it has here on the East Coast, it was great. The Green Swamp was the best airport here really, and we would fly it in. I got to the place in my life where I was above the law. Dale claims that he was intro to Escobar to broker a deal that would make Varnum Town one of several new waypoints for cocaine on the East Coast. The introduction was made by a smuggling contact who we'll call Tito, a drug dealer from Nicaragua, who we've confirmed does exist. According to Dale, he and Tito met Escobar on a private landing strip in Nicaragua. I seen human bodies laying there. On the side of the runway? No, on the little trail going to the runway, there was like human bodies. So you get, you walk down the path, and yeah. what were they doing? They being Escobar's henchmen, not the bodies. Making cocaine. And how were they making it? They were taking it to the table. They had it piled up right there. They take a shovel and go pour it on the table, and then shovels. There was so much cocaine they were shoveling. Yeah, it. They, they, um, they had a cocaine. They take the cocaine in a shovel. You're saying you're putting your hand up that's like four feet high. No, it's probably Three. about the size that entire rim. I see. So that's maybe two yeah, feet. Three. Two feet piles yeah, of yeah. cocaine. Dale tells us that he then meets Escobar in his personal compound, after. Pleasantries. Uh, what, what kind of pleasantries? Well, like, you shake hands? Or, this Escobar shake hands? I don't think, I don't I think you shake hands. Know. Okay, you just say hello. Maybe you bow. Before I left, I went in a room, and Pablo, he looks at me. He said, Mr. Dale, I didn't know how he known my name, and he said, the Americanas, the stupid people, these Americanas, very stupid they said, over here, we know what this stuff do to you. We know what it does. You Americanists, 
you snort it, you eat it, you stick it in your veins. He said, you stupid people. That's what he told me. And on that wall up there was bottles, court jars. And the first jars I looked at on the wall, it had eyes, human eyes. It looked like they had formaldehyde in there. And then I looked over here, kind of on the other wall there, tongues in there, tongues. And those tongues was people that talked too much. And then I looked over there, ears, human ears in, in them jars. They were people that heard too much. So this is crazy. He is telling us that Pablo Escobar has jars of tongues and eyes and ears yeah. on his wall. The first thing that comes to mind for me is, is he traveling with all these jars? So everywhere he goes, he's, <laughs> he's got like the narco trafficker interior designer who's like, where do you want the ears? Or are you putting all the eyeballs on one shelf right. and the tongue, or do you mix them up? Does he have a truck that drives around with this collection of body parts? Now, hopefully it's refrigerated. Or does he fly it? Oh, maybe. It's in probably the REO Speedwagon plane. In the REO Speedwagon, the speedwagon <laughs> plane. The weather's nice out today, Kyle, uh, and that's, that's why I'm thankful for today's sponsor, Via. Via offers a wide range of gummies, some with and some without THC. And each of these gummies have strengths and effects that cater to your routines. Their gummies have great flavor, they're vegan, they're made with organic ingredients, and Via is the only lifestyle hemp brand that offers a craft cannabis experience. They use compounds found in hemp, along with active plant extracts, to create products, each with a specific effect in mind. So whether you want to get better sleep, or ease anxiety. They have something for everybody. And again, they, they also have the zero THC products. So if THC isn't for you, you can still take advantage of their CBD line with products designed for sleep and focus and energy. Head to viahemp.com, use the code TOWN to receive 15% off, plus one free sample of their Sleepy Dreams gummies. You have to be 21 years or older. That's via hemp, V I I A H E M P dot com. Use the code town at checkout. Let the gummies work their magic. I want to tell you a story about an inventor named Alexander. A number of years ago, his 14 year old nephew was diagnosed with a cancerous growth in his heel. And even after the boy had heel replacement surgery. The kid was given little chance of ever walking free from pain. Now, Alexander was an inventor. He was a mechanical engineer and a former army medic, and he was determined to find a way to help his young nephew, to find something that would allow him to live an active life without being held back. The flash of insight came on an airplane flight. Alexander was landing in a jet, and as the plane touched down, there was barely a bump. And Alexander thought, wait a second, if a massive aircraft can land this smoothly, absorbing hundreds of tons of impact without really even shaking people that much, why couldn't a shoe do the same thing? So Alex assembled a team of mechanical engineers, podiatrists, industrial designers, and applied materials engineers to form the Impact Research Technology Group. And they developed a shoe called the Gravity Defier. The results and the comfort were incredible, and it allowed Alexander to deliver on his dream of helping his nephew, but now it's also helping people all over pursue an active life. And that can include you too. Visit gdefy.com because like Alexander's nephew, you deserve to be comfortable. And here's a little extra love for our Varnum Town listeners. Use the discount code TOWN for an exclusive $30 off on orders of 150 or more. Experience the miracle that is G-Defy, where comfort meets innovation. I've been playing this game on my phone recently. It's called June's Journey, and it's pretty beautiful, actually. There's a story to it. It's about this woman named June Parker, whose sister and brother-in-law were mysteriously killed. This is in the 1920s. And June goes to their estate to try to figure out what happened. The look of the game is really enticing. It's beautiful. It takes you back to the 1920s, to kind of like a bygone era of mystery and danger and, and romance. And it immerses you in June's world. And the way you play it, it's, it's a hidden object mystery game. So you're looking 
at these scenes and you have to try to figure out where things are and you tap on them and those become clues. So you are actually kind of like the detective here. You're investigating these beautifully detailed scenes of the 1920s to uncover the mystery of what happened. I'm pretty deep into it already, and the question is, can you crack the case? Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. We left with three, was it 3.4 million or 3.8 million dollars worth of cocaine. You bought approximately three to four million dollars worth of cocaine from Pablo Escobar. Which would be worth over 12 million today. Describe what it was like to meet him. He was all right. To me, he seemed like a good person. What did he think about you? He thought I was all right. No, I'd never hurt him. I mean, he never hurt me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. That's Dale's story of how he became a kingpin. And it's not only wildly implausible, it's also extremely hard to prove. We've tried to confirm that Dale was indeed out of the country at this time, but he might have flown private, so there's no passport records, no travel records. The reality is, the mystery, really, is that massive amounts of cocaine did end up flowing into Varnum Town in the 80s, which we've been able to confirm with law enforcement. And so what we're left with at the end of the day is just Dale's story. There's an element of myth-making here Mm. with Dale where he's spinning a tale, whether it's true or not, but putting himself at the center of it. Totally. Yeah, he is the center of the story. After we finished our conversation about Pablo Escobar outside the plastic tunnel... Dale leads us around a collection of outbuildings and into something I can barely believe. I'm going to go around and open it up into the town. Into the town? When you say town, you don't mean Varnum Town. No, I'm No, I've always just built crazy places. We turn a corner and walk into what can only be described as a replica town. Never seen anything like it. It's like a western town with buildings or structures on either side as you walk down. Okay. This is like the OK Corral. It's like a western set. Here's a kind of an old west drugstore. Did anybody help you build this? I haven't met anybody before who has manifested the interior of their mind in a way like this before. Yeah. We, could, this, we could do this... Uh, uh, for 24 hours, just to describe, and we wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> we would we never have gone get to the 10 end. feet. No, no, just describing what we're seeing. A uh, motorized wheelchair. Yes. And a coffin. And a coffin. And a cat. And some devil masks. Yeah. It's an old western town, or it's a town of some sort anyway. Yeah. It's, there's like a barber shop with a sign that says, hair or throat with a pair of scissors. <laughs> 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 Which is not, it's not a very encouraging barber shop. No. Here's a a, a fake brick building that says uh, Southern Ladies Whippet House, a great place to get spanked. Yeah. Why did you build this? I just, believe it or not, every bit it just snapped together. Say that again, it just snapped together? Yeah. It's like the replica world that Dale has built here is almost bigger than the actual town of Varnum Town. It has a lot more going on, maybe... Maybe this is his ideal vision for what he wanted Varnum Town to become. I think you're onto something. I think it is his ideal. It goes on and on. It's like, you know what? It's like Westworld meets Scarface meets Willy Wonka. (laughs) And we just got the golden ticket. I don't think it's a golden ticket, though. It's like a rotten ticket. Yeah, I'm not sure I want it. There's the sheriff's office. Yeah, Dale's, Dale's enforcement agent. Yeah. yeah. It's a vision of the town where he is the central character. Yeah. Instead of drug enforcement agency, it's Dale's enforcement agency. The part that I can't figure out is, what the hell does this mean? What is this? Who would build an entire replica town 
of their own town in their backyard. And for whom? Is it yeah. for an audience? Is it for Dale? Is it for... Or is it like therapy in some way? It feels like it may not be for anybody other than himself. You know, so you, you inform on your friends and neighbors, and are they not angry at you because they felt like they did it, and, and did everybody want to stop the drug trade at that point? Is that why they weren't angry? They're like, you know what, this has gone far enough, it's fine that Dale shuts it down, and we should all move on. Is that why they weren't angry? Because I was tired of it, I was fed the heck up with it, I didn't need it, it ain't about money with me. I had so much money between you and me, I didn't know what to do. I'm a piece yep. of trash, but you oh. know what I mean? That's how I feel about myself because of my past. Is part I'm of that the to fact change that my you, past. Is, you know what I mean? Is part of that that you cooperated? Did that make you feel bad? Yeah, I had no other choice. I had no other choice but to do what I had to do. It, it ain't just me, everybody did. Yeah. Do you think any kind of an apology or anything? Did did, did yeah. you yeah. offer any kind of a... Uh, did you have to apologize? Sorry? No, yeah. I ain't had was... to apologize to nobody. No, we're just trying to understand your role in the community. Well, and there's My th role in the community was was I was feeding people, taking care of people. I would look out people. I'd go around and put money up under somebody's mm -hmm. door that needed mm -hmm. it. You know what I'm trying to do? So you do? thought you were doing something good here by bringing this in, bringing money to I the was. community, helping I the was. community. It sounds like it all just got to be too much. I always had so many people jealous of me because I, of money. According to Dale, this jealousy created tension within the community that perhaps was never there when everybody was equally poor. They're all on the same level. But now there's disparities in wealth, and it makes people look at each other differently. I was dancing with the devil, and you dance with the devil, you gotta pay the piper. And that's what I did in my life. I paid the piper. It, it's a complicated story. Well, and it, you're a complicated person. It's, uh, it is. You know what I mean? And I know that. You know, it's, well, hey. why don't you show us a little bit more? We'll go this way, yeah? Yeah, you've got a lot more secrets. We do. Yeah. Well, this is just there, the beginning. There's, a, there's even a place right there in the house right there that uh, I, I would hide cocaine and stuff and put it in there in a horse. Had, and in, I had horses stuff. And I remember pouring a thing of cocaine out, and my, my horse went there. This man was buying cocaine. He would go to the horse. There was another encounter we had with Dale that was noteworthy. During our reporting, we were driving down the main street in Varnum Town, and Dale blows past us in his two-seater Mercedes sports car. The odd thing was that he stays in the lane of the oncoming traffic and does not merge back into our lane. He's driving on the wrong side of the road, fast. Just for fun. Uh, here comes the car. He's playing a game of chicken with the oncoming car. That's appears to be what's happening. Yeah, he's really going for it here. And, oh, he's that poor car, his oncoming car. Just barely. They didn't, they didn't slow down either. Do you think they know it's Dale and they're just like... They didn't look very concerned. They did not look concerned. <laughs> if there was a car coming down the wrong side of the road at high speed at me, I would stop. Yes. Those people did not stop. Again, the logic of this town <laughs> is, is, is hard to wrap your mind around. In the next and last episode of Varnum Town, we're going to hear from a drug dealer that Dale ratted out, a guy who went to jail as a result. And I think you're going to be surprised about how he feels about Dale now. We're also going to hear from former governor of North Carolina, Mike Easley, the guy who helped prosecute all the cases coming out of Varnum Town and the surrounding area. Did the prosecutions make a difference? What happened to Varnum Town? What's it like there now? We'll find out together. So stick with us on the next episode of Varnum Town. Varnum Town is produced by Epic Magazine, Picture Perfect Federation, and Full Picture in association with Podcast One. Special thanks go out to the residents of Varnum Town for telling their story and to Lynn Betts for her help. The Epic team includes Harry Spitzer, Josh Levine, Frank Slodisco, Melise Tussere, Dan O'Sullivan, and Leela Tulin. Additional reporting by Kijin Higashibaba. The Picture Perfect Federation team includes Patrick Waxberger, Ashley Stern, Tyler Nell, and Samina Martin. The full picture squad is Desiree Gruber and Ann Walls. 
Frank Reyna supported me during production. Original music composed by Jana Bechtolt and Rob Kieswetter. Additional music provided by American Production Music, Epidemic Sound, and Premium Beats. Studio recordings took place at Silver Lake Recording Studios.